Hey everybody, welcome to the Coastal Noise Podcast. I'm going to keep this really short because we are under a tornado warning right now. We did this whole podcast pretty much in bad weather. Once again, second podcast in a row. Jim Pinkston, when he was here, we had you know tons of rain and we tried to avoid this uh, weather, kind of weather for this episode, but happens again and sirens are going off. They'll probably start going off in a minute here. So I'm going to wrap this up and get away from all this electrical equipment. This was a great conversation uh, with David Elliott of WOX and uh, a really fun time. We went and talked about a broad spectrum of things, mostly focusing, revolving around um, his career in journalism, advice. He has the challenges, the rewarding parts, and then we branch off into um, good authors and movies and legalizing marijuana. So really interesting conversation. Hope you enjoy it. And if you want to hear more podcasts, go to CoastalNoise.com, the podcast page. Should be having some announcements of other guests coming up soon. You can follow me, Stefan Lawson Music, on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, keeping up with Coastal Noise Media on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so yeah, go check all that out and follow along. And of course, if you want to support the show, the best way you can do it is to subscribe on places like YouTube or to like the posts that you uh, find this on, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, sharing it would be awesome. It's the best thank you you could give me and the guests here that come on the show. And besides all of that, I'm going to be traveling, doing hopefully some podcasts out of state here pretty soon and some other cool stuff. So You can see that those travel posts as they occur. So that's it. We'll go ahead and start the episode now. This is Coastal Noise Podcast number 66 with David Elliott. Well, let's see what the old head... Oh, I love headsets. Oh, they're great, right? Check two, check two, check two. There's the sweet spot. That's it. All right. You good? I am. Perfect. All All right. dare go that far (laughs) all right welcome everybody to the coastal noise podcast i'm here with david elliott of wlx news dave has been working with wlox for over 20 years and is currently on the air seven days a week doing segments such as the four o'clock show and wlox news at five through the weekdays as well as weekend segments on saturdays and sundays dave also has experience working in radio broadcasting from his time in jackson mississippi before he transitioned to the Gulf Coast to work with WLOX in 1985. Dave, how are you doing? Excellent, Stefan. Thanks as, for having me on board. As an expert, to, you can be honest. How was that for an intro? It was perfect. Work on your W's, though. Double W's, yeah. yeah. work on your W's. I caught that. I saw that yeah, as I was going yeah, through. No, you know? that's, that's the old broadcaster W. Yeah. So, but that's all. That's, that's a strong all, W you got there. <laughs> well, I've worked, you know, I, I've paid dearly for that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to do the show that dove a little bit deeper into the world of journalism, reporting, and broadcasting, partly out of a desire to do better with what I do here, you know, because I have a passion for learning, writing, and presenting content. And I've wanted to reach out to WLX for a long time since it's been one of the local top dogs in the area for decades. At first, I was prepping an email to just reach out to the organization at large. Uh, But then I said, well, let me go and check to see if the the staff has a page online or something like that. And I went on and I saw your picture and I thought, well, who better to have a discussion with about the subject matter than the guy who basically lives on the air seven days a week. Yeah, can you you imagine that? That might, I I may be the only guy in America that can make that claim and that seven day a week claim. I have the engineers working on an eighth day back in the laboratory in the basement (laughs) at WLOX. So we'll see how that works out. Yeah. And, and just as the guy, you know, who, who, uh, on local television all the time as I was growing up. So I reached out to you directly and it really sparked my interest when you mentioned some, you know, unfavorable views of journalism today, because, uh, and I want to explore that to the full, you know, scope of, of what goes on in the industry and how it's changing with the growth of the internet and all the outlets like Google news, YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, uh, podcasts like this. So, I'd like to know more about your experience and your thoughts for the industry's future and a little, 
inside knowledge for maybe aspiring students of the trade. But uh, before we go too deep into that into that pool, I was thinking we could start off by just getting a little background information on you sure. and your history. And one of the things I wanted to ask you first, and I was doing a little research on on the website. How long has WLOX been in operation? I couldn't find that anywhere. Oh, golly. How I'm far not, back do sure. they go? I, I imagine they go back to the 50s. Really? Uh, they used to be in for old timers who are listening. The old Buena Vista Hotel until uh, 69 Hurricane Camille took it out, owned by the Love family. But I imagine that would be probably the late 50s. They were probably there during the transition from black and white to color and wow. from film to videotape. And now here we are in the digital world. World, so I, I I never worked film, but I uh, was there during the video videotape days. So. Mm -hmm. But I honestly I couldn't tell you a year when uh, WLOX first signed on the air. But they've been such a big part of this community forever. So yeah, yeah. And can you give us a rundown on how you developed an interest in journalism and reporting? What schooling you received, and just kind of your major career bullet points that ultimately led you to where you are today. Well, actually, I'm going to go way back to when I was a kid. My okay. dad was the head of the speech department at the University of Minnesota. I grew up in Minneapolis. And he had a television show on public television in Minnesota. He taught radio TV at the U. And when I was a little kid, I was the oldest uh, of three boys. And I was kind of a daddy's boy. So I always hung out with my dad. So I used to actually go to his classes. And I used to do all these things. I used to go to his TV show. He would he did voiceovers, national voiceovers. He had an unbelievable voice. But uh, for Toro and, and other products that I can't think of right now. So I used to go with him to recording sessions. And so I kind of began to develop an interest at that point. And then I became a big fan of music. So I started thinking more about radio and uh, ended up going to the University of Minnesota, uh, getting a job in radio right out of school in, in Jackson, Mississippi. I'd never been in the South and, uh, and worked, bounced around for a couple of years, about four different radio stations in Jackson, uh, all different formats, it was amazing. And uh, then ultimately uh, landed with a splat in television. So. Yeah. And, and before going into that, that part of television, what kind of stuff would you do in radio? What were those different formats like? Well, I started out, uh, this, this station was a killer. If you have anyone who knows anything about Jackson, Mississippi, it was WZZQ. It was uh, rock and it was just a monster in, in Mississippi in the 60s, 70s. And that was my first job. I did two to six in the morning. I was fresh out of college, 23 years old. Took a train down actually to Jackson and bought a $400 car or something. But, um, and, th and then I went over to an, an urban radio station, which is a kind way of saying uh, African-American or black radio station. It did news for them in the morning and then went over to kind of a middle of the road, number one station in town and did kind of a goofy morning show with another guy. And uh, so that was over only about three years, three stations. So one might say, what's with this guy's work record? Either he's... Uh, you know, uh, not very dependable or he's, uh, you know, his uh, attention span is short or something, but it's just the way it happened. Radio mm -hmm. in those days, there was a lot of mobility, particularly in a market. You would see guys move uh, from station to station within a market. That was very popular, it seemed, back in the uh, uh, early 80s. So. Yeah. And what what did you like most about that particular trade? Well, you know, I was in radio on the, the end of what I considered kind of the golden age. Of, I mean, obviously the golden age was radio. Radio was Edward R. Murrow and, and uh, all of that. But it was when stations were still locally owned and operated before the corporations came in and started gobbling up all of the radio stations. We'll jump ahead in, in a moment, if you like, to the groups that now own eight stations in a market, which I think is is sacrilegious almost, in my opinion. Uh, but then 
we I enjoyed it. We still had records, actual LPs at WZZQ when I worked there. When I did the news in the morning for the uh, urban station, I actually had news departments at radio stations. I don't have those anymore. Don't be fooled. If they if you are listening to your local radio station and you hear somebody on a voice track recorded, they're not sitting there live, of course. There's somebody who's on doing something else on one of the other radio stations they own under a different name. You know, so they're, they're reading WLOX stuff off of our website or something out of the local newspaper. So I, uh, and then just as I left radio is, is when I believe it was kind of the beginning of the end of old fashioned radio. So mm -hmm. Interesting. So then after that time you ended up at WLOX. Well, no, I went to an, an audition in Jackson, Mississippi at the CBS station, WJTV up there for a new show they were launching. So exciting, you know, uh, Dancing Girls, Balloons, uh, the Red Carpet. Uh, it was called PM Magazine. It was kind of a, a you know, the, the typical man and woman around town. Today we're bringing you the show from the Jackson Zoo. You know, tomorrow, Lord knows where we'll be. Make sure you tune in. Anyway, there were probably about 50 guys at the audition, whittled it down to 10, whittled it down to 5, down to 2, very dramatic. And I ended up getting that job. And uh, that lasted for about a year. Then I transitioned into news at JTV. And I knew the owner of WLOX, Jimmy Love, and he was always after me to move to the coast. And I finally did it. So that was in 86. 1986. You said 20 years, but that now tells us that's 31 years. So. 31. <laughs> Darn. Oh, you're in shock. That's older than you are. 95, 95. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. You're right. 31 years. Okay. Maybe the website says 20. I don't know. No, it's 1985. 1985 is when it says yeah. you. 86. Come I came down. Yeah. So okay. we'll have to change that. I'll have to get to our dig with our digital people to make sure in the interest of accuracy yeah. that we get that straight. <laughs> yeah. 31 years. Thanks for reminding me, Steph. <laughs> Thanks for that, that little stroll down, that painful stroll down memory lane and realizing uh, how long I've been there and how old I am. So. <laughs> well, while, while we're still on memory lane, who, in your opinion, who are some of the key figures of voices of radio or journalism from from the past or even, or the present? Well, I mean, really, I mean, I, I was on, it's odd, even as I was very young, I kind of watch, I think it's because my dad was very politically active, uh, but I, uh, but I well, Cronkite, uh, you know, uh, um, guys like that, uh, Brinkley, David Brinkley, uh, a little bit later, I, I, I thought Peter Jennings at ABC was very good. Uh, so those were the guys I kind of uh, grew up with. I don't like any of the anchors at the uh, networks today, but I don't like them. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but I think it's a different. Don't like what they're doing probably more so than. Well, I don't like the way the shows are produced necessarily. I think they are in the old days. You could tell the guy, the anchors were in charge of the show. Now mm -hmm. it's the anchors are being. Like, puppeteered yeah puppeteered by the producers of the show mm -hmm. and uh there's a big day i mean jennings and these guys they had total control over their show cronkite these guys they you know they probably had two producers where they now have you know 22 producers mm -hmm. and uh you know those guys made all of the editorial decisions and and that stuff but that that's changed a lot right now it's like we're very producer driven now even at a small station and, like WLX. And advertisers are a big factor into it as well. Yeah, sure. Well, I don't pay much attention to the advertisers. Can you edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> well, when there's money involved, you know, it's like the producers are going to want to do what those advertisers, I imagine, would want. Well, there's write. no, you know, there's more pressure rather than from advertisers. There's actually more pressure on, I'm not a big fan of, of, uh, focus group kind of research sort of uh I, I always like to say a doctor doesn't ask the patient how to operate how to perform the surgery so why do professional broadcasters ask the viewers <laughs> what, what they want to see I, you know, I'm, a, I'm one of these guys where we'll decide what you see so there's so a lot of their their uh content is driven, I think, by, hey, look what's viral on Facebook right now, or look what people are talking about, you know. Did you see that tweet? 
Mm-hmm. We got to do a story on that, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and it all moves so quickly, yeah, yeah, because content is exchanged so so fast, and it becomes irrelevant so quickly. And we also have so many newscasts now. When I broke into this business, we had a five, a six, and a ten. Every station did. That's all they had. Maybe they did token morning coverage. A few of them had a noon show. We now do three hours in the morning, an 11 o'clock show, a 4 o'clock show, which I anchor, 5 o'clock show, which I anchor, 6, 6.30, 10, uh, and 5, 6 shows on the weekend. So there's, in, so there's a great demand, I think, for content, too. Mm. Repeat content, I'm afraid. Mm. Repackaged. So do you think there's more opportunities for young journalists, people that are interested in as reporters to, for there to be more job opportunities? Cause I always was under the impression that they were hard to come by and incredibly hard to land. Yeah, they are. It's because staffs, you know, they're, they've cut the number of people and multitasking has become, and also I'm one of the few I'll tell, well, I'll tell you a story about how later about if you want to go that direction. I'm actually shooting stuff by myself on my iPhone now. They have these incredible iPhones and editing apps on our phones at the at WLOX where I'm enjoying actually doing that. But I'm one of the last, there's one of the last guys who has a photographer. Photographers are the disappearing, are the dinosaurs heading to the tar pit in television mm-hmm. because all we hire now are one man bands. Mm-hmm. They call them MMJs, multimedia journalists. I think they give it a okay. fancy, fancy name, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so now they they have to go out. They have to shoot their own stuff. You know, they have to, I edit my own stuff, which I love because editing's the storytelling of uh, television, in my opinion. But uh, they, uh, yeah. So the it, kids better who get into journalism now. It's not quite as glamorous as it used to be, mm. and the job's not quite as plentiful. So. Mm. And it's probably shifting to more of a technical orientated. Yeah. Did you better be ready to, you know, provide digital content as well and plenty of it. Mm. So, so you do your own editing. Yeah. I do all my own editing. Well, my, all the stories that I do, I do the editing. I don't edit the little 20 second things you see of the, of the disaster in Syria or the latest Trump tweet or what's happening with healthcare, all the little components in a 30 minute broadcast. But I, the stories I do, I edit. What is your editing process like? Uh, I always see stories. I'm old school. I got to see them as like a, a, a minute and a half movie. You know, I, I, a beginning, a middle, and an end uh, with kind of a cinematic more approach sort of to telling a story. So, hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges of working in your field? Uh uh, to me, it really is the 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 multitasking. The you're out doing a story. You've got to get the tweet back. I'm not opposed to Twitter. I'm not naive. Uh, you have to get it on dot com right away. As a matter of fact, we have a uh, initiative now called Digital First, where you know before you do your television story, make sure we get it on the web. So uh, and I have a little bit of a problem with that. But uh, so the, the, those are the challenges for me. Frankly, and I hope they're not listening, I, working with kind of young, inexperienced producers is, can be a little frustrating sometimes because you feel like you have to kind of save the show. But Yeah, working together with the team. Yeah, to, I'm an to, individual sports guy. Yeah. 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 I play golf, not uh, basketball. Yeah. Uh, well, who speaking of that team? Um, is who, that my phone? I think it is. Wow, you've got like you see, a, that's how, uh, how dumb <laughs> I am. How, how old I am? I don't kill my phone. That's happened before. Tell me that's happened before on your show. Oh, sure, sure. It oh, actually okay. happened with Mr. Jim last time, and he goes as he's talking, and I'm like, I can barely hear it, and he keeps talking, and he goes, "I apologize, that's my phone," and he just keeps talking. <laughs> yeah. The phone's still ringing. I'm like. That's cool. Well, I mean, who knows what it could be? I could be called in for the breaking news, you know. That is, oh, sure, sure. How often does that happen? It, well, that happens a lot. Uh, uh, I'll be, um, you know, I, I, I love, here's, here's what I like about television. I love anchoring. Mm-hmm. That's, that's my favorite thing. I, I love interviews, and I do a lot of interview shows, particularly kind of political interviews. And I love live shots. So, so I guess kind of all the things I've described are kind of, it's the live 
buzz that I get out, out of television is being on live. Yeah, yeah. Much more than going out, shooting a story at 10 o'clock, coming back, logging your sound bites, writing your copy, mm -hmm. editing it, and putting it on the air five and a half hours later. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather go out and anchor a 30-minute show live. It's done. Mm -hmm. You know, and you never know what's going to happen sometimes, so. Mm -hmm. And I secretly like it when things go a tad awry. So. Yeah, yeah. A little excitement in it. Yeah. Well, how often do you go out into the field as opposed to being in the station? Well, I'm out. I didn't used to go out very much, uh, as much as I do now. But uh, the, back to the uh, insatiable appetite for content, I'm out now reporting uh, three, four days a week. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you come back and you've got to... Uh, f with a story and then a little bit of video with maybe a, a sound bite for another newscast. So editing right up to about three o'clock and then go on the air at four. So it's all pretty tight. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of the rest of your team, who are some of the most important people that do jobs that help make a new show possible, but are often kind of behind the scenes. And so as a result, aren't thought about as much from the general public. Hmm. Is there anybody who's kind of the underdog and they don't get the light? You know, they just kind of. Well, all of them, I guess, don't get the light. Uh, the li are in the limelight or the spotlight. Uh, the, the directors, the guys who punch the buttons and make sure the video rolls and the the graphics are are, are right. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, those are probably kind of the unsung heroes. The producers who uh, are always being bombarded by management with different ideas who are oftentimes down to a deadline putting a show together I, I you know i admire the work that they do they're young mm -hmm. they'll learn what about the some of the ethical concerns that you might be faced with in your line, line of work what kind of concerns do you face and how do you navigate them well, that, you know that's always a tough one because journalism I, I i try to um, imagine that journalism the rules haven't changed too much i think with the advent of cable tv and i believe the networks have gone away a little bit from their traditional uh standards uh the competition from the internet uh you know that's a hard one in a market like this we 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 don't we're no, we don't have a lot, a lot of pressures. We, we can pretty much take on anybody we want and not worry about the consequences too much. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't really, uh, I don't know, that, that, that's a tough one for me on the ethical standards. I, I do think, I try not to let my personal beliefs in any way seep into anything I write or say. We're only human, so it's inevitable that it does. But uh, I don't grapple with that a lot now. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty disciplined. Is And that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about is personality, character, kind of bleeding through your reporting or whatever it is that you're doing as a journalist, as a reporter, as an anchor. Is there, do they classically train you in school if you're going through that to have that kind of What's the training that goes into that? Or how do people ingrain that just the facts kind of attitude? Well, I mean, I, they're still teaching from from books. In, I mean, in college, they're still teaching from old journalism ethics 101. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I don't, you know, a lot of the journalism professors I run into today are generally of my generation or even a little older, it seems. So the, that that training will be pretty stock, pretty generic, pretty traditional. And then you'll find when you get out in the real world, it, it changes a little bit. I'm one of these guys. Here's one thing I'll say about that ethics thing. I, I like to interview the newsmakers, the elected officials, ask them the questions that need to be asked. Now there's this great desire in our business. And I don't mean to say anything bad about Joe Citizen or Joe blow uh well, what is what is what do the people think i don't want to see any suits in this story i'm like well you have to ask the suit story questions you have to go you know if a story is about you know uh 
a controversy down at the wastewater treatment plant. You have to go to the utility authority and ask them what's the deal. You don't go ask the people in the neighborhood, what do you think about it? I mean, I guess you could incorporate their perspective into it, but right now there seems like there's, there's an overemphasis on just going and, and finding out what the, the people in the neighborhood think. And I know this isn't coming up. Instead of going to the source. Yeah, I mean, I'm old school on that. You know, we don't. There's a there's kind of a bit of a of a mantra in no suits. They say in a story. Well, yeah, if you're doing a story on, you know, the local the marching band or... going to Macy's, you know, Thanksgiving Day Parade, sure. But if it's a story about you know corporations yeah, and the, legalities yeah and and, and, and and public law you have to go i believe to the you know to the people who are responsible mm -hmm. and we've drifted a little bit away from that i even see that on the networks hmm. um what part of what you do on a weekly basis do you think takes up the most of your energy what's mentally taxing to you uh pl planning <laughs> Because I'm, I'm kind of neurotic about time and about communication and organization. And it seems like a lot of people are running a million different directions, a million miles an hour, and it drives me kind of crazy. So I guess my, I kind of want to know where I'm supposed to be at 11 o'clock on Monday, mm -hmm. what I have to do at one o'clock on Tuesday, mm -hmm. make sure I'm ready for the live show at four o'clock on, on Thursday and nothing's getting in the way of that. So I guess my neurosis is just kind of time and organization. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the toughest thing for me because not everybody is quite as disciplined on that. I have to, yeah. I have to fight that all the time. So. Sure. Because there's probably so much going on with, all the things that not only happen, but the mediums through which you can access them through. Sure. There's probably a lot of distractions going on. That's oh, probably yeah. a lot really hard. And then your schedule and your what you have to do probably shifts a lot more now than what it used to as yeah, a result. Exactly. Something gets so. pinged and goes across the world and it becomes news somewhere or... And you have to address it. You know, suddenly mm -hmm. it's been moved up in the rundown of a show and... I mean, it's not that I'm not flexible. I, I love a, a very fluid show and, and when things are happening and breaking news and all that kind of stuff. I'm just a little neurotic about the organization, knowing where I have to be at a particular time and making sure everything goes like clockwork. Mm -hmm. so. Do you now or have you ever engaged in certain practices to better improve skills relevant to your job, i.e. writing or speaking? Hmm. Uh, writing, actually, believe it or not, Facebook has helped me become a little, and I can't believe I'm saying this, a little bit of a better writer. I post a lot on Facebook, on my personal page. I have to be careful on my WLOX page. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, and even my personal page, I should be careful. And behind my back, they're probably saying I need to be more careful. But uh, believe it or not, that has helped me a little bit. Uh, and I, I, it helps I try to be colorful on writing. I try to choose words and phrases and terms mm -hmm. that are a little more colorful. Mm -hmm. And as and what was the other part besides writing? Just presentation, talking. Yes, yeah, speaking. Voice. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think I've been around the block enough where I think I've got that down. Kind of autopilot. Yeah. What's your protocol if something's going wrong with the voice? If you got a sore throat or anything that's affecting your ability to communicate? Uh, thankfully, I, 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 don't, I don't really seem to have that, that, that problem too much. You battle through it. I mean, you know, just like a singer would have to do it or an actor mm -hmm. on stage would have to do it. You just have to just have to battle through it. I don't do anything like gargle Any with honey and, and garlic before a show or, yeah, yeah. or anything like that. No. Yeah, okay. Is there anything you do as a warm up for your voice? No, not really. No? No. No. I just kind of on autopilot with the voice. Yeah. Huh? And I don't don't <clears throat> I get a lot of the younger reporters who want me to listen to their voice tracks, listen to their narr narrative. 
mm-hmm. listen to their the way they read their copy and i hear a lot of a lot of their inflections are wrong you know where you know don't, why are you going up on that reflection inflection no end it with a nice going down on an inflection so mm-hmm. I, I i do think a lot when i first got into television and i still know anchors who do it today will actually go through copy and make little marks now with the on the computer and the teleprompter it's not quite as uh, easy but we'll make little ups and downs when when's the best time to do an inflection like you're asking a question when's the best time to end and say that's the city council will take that up next tuesday you know when you go down when you go up when you pause you know phrasing and so i, I a lot of our young reporters have problems with that and i try to they don't have energy it's another big thing. You have to have constant, you know, you don't, that doesn't mean talking fast. That just means having a certain sense of urgency in the way you read mm-hmm. and don't sound like you're reading. That's another one. It's not like you're talking, right. you know, to the person next to you, you know, you know, mm-hmm. try to imagine it as a conversation, not more than a reading copy. Yeah. Make it authentic, yeah. not, not artificial. Yeah, you know. and I say like commercials. You hear everybody hates the commercials they hear that play over and over again of just the terrible voice actors doing a very cheesy, plain vanilla yeah. dialogue. Yeah, which, you know you have to have a little bit of you know uh, a little bit of I I can get kind of dramatic when I'm reading a little bit on t- on it, whether it's a murder, a fire, a terrorist attack. You know I, I like. I kind of like not cheesy, but colorful, mm-hmm. uh, impactful words and terms and phrases. So, mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you a, for, for, on a personal level, what would you recommend if somebody wanted to better their speaking voice? Uh, because just hearing you on headphones is like a whole nother ball game to me. You know, hearing you in this format as opposed to like through television speakers or whatever mic from that distance or whatever. What about the folks? What are they hearing us on right now? now this is what on their on their little computer uh, speakers. Well, uh, yes. I think it sounds best uh, through a car. <laughs> you know, I will hook it up to Bluetooth and just blast yeah. it out through there. But I have Bose in my car, so everything sounds pretty good through that. But well, it comes back. That's the oldest voice training. You know, down in the chest. Don't have it up in the throat. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't be afraid to sort of ride a sentence, you know, mm-hmm. finding the perfect words to emphasize. And uh, I'll make it a, a confession at Michigan. I smoke. I was going to ask, is that a thing that like, <laughs> no, that's, that's an old, that's an old wives tale of myth. Oh, the guy's got the pipes because he smokes. No, no, no. It doesn't have any holding. But uh, it doesn't bother me. And I've been smoking for some like, 35 years but i'm not, i don't know what that has to do with my voice but if i'm i'm but i do find it occasionally if i'm a little off voice that it might have maybe something to do with the cigarettes or something i don't know but i uh and and Pete, this here's and you say something about my voice i I'll, okay i do go to walmart Stefan. you know that don't okay you? yeah occasionally i go to walmart okay yeah so I'm in Walmart. It's a Saturday. I'm in my flip flops, my short on my ba- shorts, my baseball cap, and you know, and I'm just wandering through and anonymously until I start talking, and then everyone say Dave Elliott. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I do have a kind of a distinctive voice. Yeah. I can't. I, mean, I can't tell you the millions. Exaggeration. Times uh, that has happened though that literally I'll be standing yeah. in the checkout lane or the the cashier will be there and they won't make they won't make that connection. If I'm wearing a tie and a suit, they they will more often make the connection. But if I'm in the old uh, uh, you know sort of weekend thing, but then as soon as I say something, they're uh, don't they tell you again the newsman. Yeah, yeah. I get, no, actually, I get the weatherman a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not the weatherman. I hope one day to be a weatherman. I don't, but that's one of my answers. Yeah. Who, if you had to shoot off maybe like three names of just really great speakers to just listen to? Mm. Boy, you could, should have emailed me a question like that one, Seven, because I'm going to have to think about that one. Can I, well, there's nobody really in news. That could I, be that anybody really a like speaker that. somebody who does uh you know keynote speeches or something like that um i can't really think of anyone off the top of my head that's one i'm gonna have to uh all of your podcast participants i'm gonna have to get 
give them a call later and tell, give them the answer to that question. Okay. Because I just can't think of anybody off the <laughs> well, top. I'll tell of you my what, head. you you let me know. Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp? No. Nah, <laughs> Actually, it was horrible the other day on this. Uh, the one's the last time an actor assassinated a president. I don't know if you saw that. No. Uh, yeah, he did, he did a cheesy John Wilkes Booth. Uh, Oh, when he was talking about killing about Trump. Trump. Yeah. I was like, damn, dude. Yeah, yeah, he did it in front of a bunch of people, and too. And then people cheered. Yeah, That's yeah. the scariest part. Well. But, uh, but when what, you know, speakers, you know, he had this kind of, I don't know if you heard him, but he was, <laughs> it was creepy to me. <laughs> Actually, I think actors have the best. Real, I like some of the actors. Uh, Kevin Spacey, man. This yeah. guy, have you ever seen him? Oh, yeah. MC an event or uh, on an interview or something? He can really exercise his voice and do some yeah. great things plus house of cards is the best show on television that's but, what everyone keeps telling me uh, well netflix it brother you're young yeah no, i know i i don't get into a lot of tv series yeah. because i'm very that's the big only on tv my... series well i watch some hbo series game of thrones uh veep uh the, the comedy and uh <laughs> larry david for any of you seinfeld oh, fans yeah, has a great. show called curb your enthusiasm Absolute which is coming show. back now is H it hbo is bringing it back so wow. this uh, i think later this summer so okay but otherwise i just watch news and sports on tv but i think actors actually if you hear them on the, the late night shows which i don't watch uh they some of them have some unbelievable voices and, and they they better and manner of speaking so very cool and kevin space i don't know why that one came to mind but well he's a talented guy yeah. he's, got, he's got a good he's got yeah. a good range i guess yeah or, or good uh vocal vocal character but uh yeah um let me see what else i got here i'm a scorpio you're a scorpio just in case you were gonna ask that it, it was actually on the list here oh, okay. it was on the next uh, I figure that would be uh, size important ele information. Size eleven shoe. Yeah. <laughs> if you do think of other people, I'll put it in the show notes. How about that? Yeah, how that about people, that? Oh, there yeah. are show notes. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I got, whenever I go back and do editing, I usually write down bullet points of what we speak about. I'll put links in there to direct people. Oh, if, okay. You know, it, it provides. You know, if I was third, how old are you? Twenty-seven. If I was thirty, thirty-two years old, you know, it's I'm an old dog now. You're not going to teach me new tricks. But if I was thirty or thirty-two, I'd be doing you should something like this. you should super easy. No, I could, I, I, I could tell super you. easy. Yeah. Oh no, I'm telling you, I could tell you, I could teach you everything you'd want to know. Yeah, I would actually be experimenting around with all sorts of things mm -hmm. different to be doing now that is happening in the digital universe. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. do you work on Macs or Windows? I'm uh, Macs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah then, is that Apple? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm a neophyte. I, you know, thank God I work around a bunch of 20 year olds because I'm like, I give them my phone and I go, well, what's the, how, how do I get this to that? How can I get this into my desktop so I can, you know, email the photograph somewhere? You know, mm -hmm. so, no, so you actually stump me with that question. If, if you have a Mac, that is, I mean, I've never owned one, but I've worked with and, and played with Apple products and they're great they're simple they're intuitive they they they're just gonna go and i'm i'm that's gonna be my next investment for sure but um if you if you're running off of that you could easily you know through simple stuff that comes with it probably you know um and i'm sure you've got mics and portable equipment you know all it takes is some mp3 files uh running it polishing it up a little bit and chopping it up editing and then you upload it to a, a, a server like i just joined a service that i loaded up to them and they send out rs feeds to itunes um, i put it up on my website directly myself what does the reach end up being i mean do they ever send you back insights on uh, how many people you're reaching what you kind of engagement you're getting sure it, it, it suddenly it, i'm asking the question yeah you know cool oh, okay. uh <laughs> this is a thing i always encourage a lot of people because i don't know a whole lot of people who do podcasts in this area but the shows i listen to um, the podcast I listen to run for like three hours an episode and reach tens of millions of people. Really? Easily. Name one talent. Uh, name, one, name one host. Uh, Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Don't know him. Well, you got to look him up, man. I will. He's, he's, I'm going to Google him now. Yeah. And what got, does he talk about? 
what he writes. He's a best-selling author on multiple books on productivity really? and 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 uh, fitness and cooking and and all different things. He's friends with Tony Robbins. He gets he's got one of the most popular podcasts out oh, there on okay. iTunes. Um, Joe Rogan, the comedian and UFC yeah, commentator. I know Joe Rogan. Tens of millions, you know, making. What about a guy like Bill O'Reilly? Glenn Beck, some of these other guys, do they if, do podcasts? Oh, I'm sure they do. Well, I know it would be does. crazy if they didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know they've got. He's got. You know, they got staffs and, and and. Actually, what I would be doing if I was young, I would be dreaming up scripting and staging, uh, weird videos that would end up going viral on Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. You can do that too. I, might, I just might. You may have inspired me. I got a. Um, I was trying to put out a thing for a bass player one time, and this guy got back to me and said, "I'm from Japan. I'm a professional. I like what you're trying to get at. Uh, here's a video of me." And I watched it, and this guy is looks like he's in a dorm room with just a camera on a stand, and he's in a woman's dress, and he's just shredding bass to this anime Japanese track, and in between cuts is chugging milk. And just doing all this weird stuff. And I'm like, what is this? And I was like, who would watch such a thing? And I looked at the numbers. I was like, oh, millions and yeah. millions of people. Yeah. Four million views. I, and another thing I'm really enjoying right now is Facebook Live. Oh, yeah. I've done some wild Facebook Lives in the, really? last, in the last year. Okay. And uh, I think they're fantastic. I love doing them. I, I'll just, I was in uh, New York over uh, Christmas before mm -hmm. the president was even uh, uh, inaugurated. I went to Trump Tower and did a uh, Facebook Live, uh, which was with police, the NYPD I was talking to. I was talking to uh, the doorman at Trump Tower. I was wandering around talking to people because it was packed. It was right around Christmas. I, uh, if you remember three and a half months ago, four months ago, the terrible tornado up in Hattiesburg. Yes. I went up there. Just I, It was on a Saturday. I wasn't even working. I just felt compelled to go up there. I got up there about three hours after the tornado touched down and people were still, their clothes were half shredded and they were still wandering through in a daze the rubble of what was once their home i ended up going to a trailer park where three people ended up dying and i did facebook lives there just talking to people and wandering around and describing what i was seeing about a month and a half ago i went over to lee circle in new orleans because this is during the monument take down the monument crisis i don't know if you remember this yeah yeah i do take down liberty square and next was davis and then was beauregard and finally lee but i went to the lee circle with general lee up on the thing and there were all these confederazis i call them no offense <laughs> To somebody who may know, the Confederate crowd was in from all over the country, you know, uh, pr protecting the monuments. And uh, Antifa, actually, New Orleans has a really big Antifa movement, believe it or not, almost as big as Portland. Antifa? That's the anti fascists you see at Berkeley, the guys who are throwing stuff, breaking windows and wearing the masks and the kind of black ninja pajamas, the millennials, your crowd. Stefan, they're breaking things. Yeah, like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I hope somebody out there listening to us knows what I'm referring to. Anti-fascists, they call themselves. They're kind of anarchists. Okay. Anyway, so the Antifa showed up, and and so the Confederate uh, protectors and the young take them down Nola and Antifa crowd were almost came to blows, and I'm live on Facebook right there. So I've really been enjoying. Uh, Facebook Live for an old dog like me. I've, I've yeah, actually so done you're, some interesting. You're embracing yeah. the technology. Yeah, the I, I love the Facebook Live, actually. Yeah, yeah. I've been enjoying which, doing those. Which is critical. I mean, if the market changes, you either have to... Oh, they're going to gonna want us to do them every day. Right, right. Eventually, they're going to want mm -hmm. it. And, and anytime there's anything big going on, they're going to want us to do a Facebook Live now. Sure. At WLOX, I guarantee you. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's the great thing about, you know, getting to do that on your own time. And, and I mean, you could branch off and do things like that and, and this and do it independently when you want to do it, produce content when I'm and how. Do now you... I'm too old, Stefan. <laughs> you I'm that? settled in my ways. You no, could, I'll do yeah, the Facebook you... Live, but I'm not going to start a podcast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you uh, could. Hey, you could get a young technician out there, throw a little bit of money uh, at it, and you'd be surprised what you could get done. Uh, Put a little thing like this in a, a studio set up in your house somewhere. Or well, actually, I could Just do it thought. because I'm not sure anyone's interested, but I could go on for three hours and do something. So, um, you know, I, I love this. 
Yeah. Uh, and the market reflects people will listen if you're consistent and you, you put out quality stuff, you know, and then you appeal to sponsors and advertisers, do a pre-roll or a post-roll for a commercial there, you know, however you want to structure it and do the social media thing. Yeah, but me, I'm just counting down my days to social security. Yeah, yeah. You know, what yeah. do you think I'm going to do? Start doing a podcast now? Hey, you might want to find a new hobby. You never know. You know, things might yeah, happen. Whittling. <laughs> um, what's been the most rewarding jobs that you've had in the industry? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, if you were to have me on, have, have had me on to talk about politics, we would, could, we would have gone a totally different direction here. I've done, I think, every gubernatorial, senatorial, uh, senator, uh, house debate in mississippi probably since about 1990 statewide and everything so i mean i'm i'm a kind of a political junkie oh, okay. so I, I i like i like uh doing stuff like that that's that's my favorite is is getting into i have a show that runs sunday mornings at 8 30 that's the sunday and the seven days a week by the way uh it's on tape taping on fridays which is a three segment so you can spend more meaningful time you know eight nine minutes a segment where it's we have the newsmakers in so so i really like that though th that's the most rewarding part of it for me i think is the the political banter mm -hmm. were there ever any jobs you had before working in your current field that help you prepare uh prepare you for journalism or television in ways that you didn't expect Mm. Another job in in media. Uh, hmm. Wow, that's a hard question, Stefan. You worked, trying to you go, worked hard on that. Trying one. to go deep. Yeah, that, you know? that, that, that's a hard one. That, that one I'm gonna have to. I would say radio because radio is the ultimate theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's there are no optics, no visuals. Everything is whatever the person listening happens to. <laughs> to to see in their in the depths of their brain so i would say and also you have to think on your feet in in radio and and so i think that's helped me that helped me a lot mm -hmm. matter of fact i think the best tv guys if you're listening out there and you're in tv but you didn't do radio shame on you because i think the best tv guys are guys who did radio really yeah the old radio now radio it's a, no one's even let me tell you a little story i was talking sure. about the corporate uh corporations now buying eight radio stations you know how many radio stations let's just say we have 20 radio stations on the coast three three corporations own all of them you can go into one of these buildings up here where they have six radio stations you won't find a human being right now there's not a person in there everything's running on a computer they're taking satellite shows from houston they're taking you know the there's everybody sitting. They're very few. Some of them have a morning show. Some of them might have kind of a night guy who's got a following who might be live. But they're you know they're a bunch of computers in a building. Mm. So, but that's radio today, and actually TV. You know, we we're now this is where I have to be careful. We're now owned by a company that owns ninety television stations or something. You know, it's, like, wow. it's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, we are just. And the worst thing about that is, you know, these companies own 90 television stations. Uh, let's break them into thirds. 30% are gold mines, money makers. The WLOX is in that category, by the way, for us. 30% are, uh, they do okay. They, they break even. Sometimes they make budget. The other 30% are dogs. So the 30% gold, is gold mines carrying the rest of them. And so, but the, the company sees everybody as you know, pretty much equal, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even know what that means. But. <laughs> uh, I've got a, a three for here. Um, how common is it for you to take heat from viewers or readers for something you said on the air or in a paper? Common. Common? I, uh, I, as I said, I'm very active on Facebook, so I have a lot of back and forth. But I like to start conversations and then stay out of them, let the people argue. But I get a lot of emails. A lot of people think I'm a smart ass. Can you say smart ass on, on podcasts? You, you can, this is the beauty of it. You can say whatever okay. you want. Well, a lot of people think I'm a little bit of a smart ass. So I do get emails on that. Uh, I used to. I used to get, uh, oh, I'd get into, you know, Trump now, he likes to 
tweet he gets in these Twitter wars. He's now in a Twitter war with, of all people, Morning Joe from MSNBC. I don't know if you follow Is he? Us. They're going back and forth. And he says, they say terrible things. He says terrible things. But he did get elected using Twitter, so it's hard to wean him off of it. But uh, I used to get emails from people, and I, my first, oh, I'd, I'd want to fire something back, you know? And then I would either get to my general manager and I'd get called in or we'd just stay have a bad. Now it's, I'm good to hear from you. God bless you. Thanks for writing. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. You know, and that's all I send back to him. And I think it actually pisses him off even more. It makes him more frustrated because it's like you're not taking them seriously. So I'm much more disciplined on going back and forth with people. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, I and don't. That's I, kind of bringing out your character too, where that might not come out in, in the, newsroom setting now you've got this these outlets that is putting you directly with the entire community getting instantaneous feedback and you can have that freedom to step outside and kind of talk to people actually yeah i, well, I walk i walk a uh i'm not going to say the plank i walk a fine line on facebook but i'm right in the middle i i i, I like to poke at the left and i like to tweak the right a little bit so i stay i go you know i i, I go different directions on facebook just to in, get in people engaged but uh, i mean i have the my wlox page i have to be careful I just, <laughs> on that one but on uh, my personal page i uh, i like to kind of like you know put a stick into the beehive occasionally yeah that heat that we were talking about, did you ever get in a negative criticism saying something that was maybe given to you by a writer or an editor and wasn't necessarily a view or an opinion? You were just the guy presenting it. Are you kidding me? We're an ABC station and we run CNN stories. I have to change lead ins all the time. Oh, yeah. The young producers copy and paste. Listen, ABC <laughs> is in. This is where I could get in trouble with ABC. These guys are, you know, because we're an ABC station. Uh, and I believe that it's so slanted right now with uh, agenda-driven uh, writing and uh, innuendo. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and LOX has to be careful. You have to know your market. We're in South Mississippi. This is Trump country, man. Mm -hmm. You know, this is uh, it's dripping red. You know, this is a, this is a very uh, conservative state. So uh, they, they have these lead-ins that our producers copy and paste when we run ABC stories and and I, I'm rewriting them all the time mm. you have to be careful mm. and I want to ask something that kind of ties in with this kind of corporate takeover and going back to what I was talking about about advertisers being in the space and um, is it outside of the realm of possibility that certain agencies create content not so much for the value of the content but specifically for the purpose of catering to and pulling in bigger advertisers for example some online video channels that have large followings they will initially broadcast or intentionally rather broadcast controversial or far-fetched stories just to get people kind of up in arms or it provides some sort of twisted entertainment value um, advertisers see it and they will fund those video creators just because they are a source of traffic um, how prevalent mm. would you say that practice is in the professional news world? And I don't think you, I don't think you see a lot of that, especially with hometown television stations. And um, even in a major market like Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, New York, you're not going to see that a lot with uh, local TV stations. You may see a little bit of that on cable. Mm. I don't even think you see it with the three big three networks. Uh, digital, I can't speak for. You know, I mean, digital might be a little more susceptible to that, you know, mm. our, uh, our, our dot com side, uh, the dark side. Sorry, Stefan. No, the uh, the digital side might be a little more susceptible to that. But, yeah, I, I you know, I honestly believe local TV stations are still trying as hard as they can to do the right thing. Yeah. I really, in spite of the corporate pressure, the advertiser pressure, the viewer pressure, I still think that local TV stations are doing a pretty good job. Is the Illuminati running running the corporate? <laughs> yeah, you would tell me yeah. if they were, right? Yeah, yeah, they're they're out there. Out Blink there right twice now. if you, do, you know, if, the third if you world, you know, the new world order. It's uh, they're marching, <laughs> and uh, you know, you got to keep an eye on the uh, what's happening in. Uh, you know, the European Union and Belgium and places like that.
Or do you ever have uh, conflicts with maybe producers who want you to present something and can you decline speaking about a topic or story that you feel is out of line or lacks credible information or is just something that you think is just unethical to present? Of course I can. Mm -hmm. I do it all the time. Yeah. yeah I mean... Uh, and what kind of exchange is... No, listen, the way I, I, I've got, you know, I've got this old-fashioned viewer, the anchor of a show, the host of a show, the guy who's been there the longest is still the boss, no matter what. You know, and, and you're the final link in the broadcast chain, you know? You're, you're the, 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 the words are coming out of your mouth. I don't care how much planning they put into it. So I, I would, will tell and have told producers, no, I'm not saying that, or no, I don't think we should do that story. I mean... Mm -hmm. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it doesn't see the light of day mm -hmm. because I stopped it. So, yeah. yeah. And, but, but I can't say that that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell somebody, are you kidding me? You, 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 you think I'm going to read that? No. It's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to rewrite it for you. But, yeah. Uh, for someone like you who does the job seven days a week on the air, um, at often at varying times of the day, how do you manage that kind of schedule? Uh, hmm. uh, it's, you know, again, I'm going to go back to planning it all. It's to me, it's all about wanting to know from day to day what you have to, what you're responsible for, where, where you have to be in, when you have to be there. And uh, with the exception of breaking news, which is happening more and more often, and we have a real emphasis now. If, do you watch WLOX, Stephen? I don't know if anyone listens. I, to I don't you, watch a lot of TV, okay. man. All right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, our Google big news. thing is news now. Mm -hmm. So there's this big, anything that's happening, it can be a branch that broke in, up an orange grove and <laughs> is threatening a shed. You know, we're going to have the live <laughs> shot on it. And, you know, I think it's a little ridiculous, frankly. But, uh, you know, that that's our big pressure now. So there, there, there is a lot of that, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not as it's the old cat in a tree, you know. But it, 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 there are a lot of things that are like, really? You know, I, but it's happening now. It's happening now. Uh, so, uh, you know, try, and everything's so weather-driven right now. Huh? It rains. The wind blows. It's been doing it for four billion years, or whatever. Yeah. Do you do take any in performance enhancing supplements or anything? No, no cigarettes. That's it. No. What about coffee? I would count. Oh, coffee. I'm a coffee guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm a coffee guy. Not yeah. throughout the day, but little. I mean, I'm. I'm one of these guys that'll pour a cup of coffee and take three sips and let it sit, you know, and walk away from it and forget about it and then pour another cup an hour later and do the same thing. So by the, by the end of the day, if my coffee tally probably isn't through the roof, but it's, yeah, I'm a coffee guy. How do you uh, take it? Uh, sugar only, maybe a little half and half if you have it. Okay. Do you have a regular sleep schedule? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I'm probably a one in the morning, go to bed, read almost every night i do watch tv unlike you seven i do watch a little tv 1 a.m that's that's pretty late yes you think so yeah i'm like 8 30 i need to be start, no I, I need to start I, getting into my no I, I between okay okay i'll compromise between 12 and 1 i'm in bed and i'm up by seven so if you go to bed are you saying you're thinking going to bed at 8 30 yeah, yeah. You're already beginning to plan to go to bed. So well, what time I'm, you get up? I'm like morning? ready to get in there and just start shutting down. Usually, no, no, depends. Like if I'm if I'm you know going through uh, working through the week or something like that. You know, I'd love to if if I just had any kind of life, I, I would definitely be going to bed probably at midnight. Yeah, I go to bed between between midnight and one and get up at yeah. uh, at seven. That that's my uh, usual. That's six seven hours of sleep that's all well i'm know. jealous and i can't sleep in on the weekend anymore you know if it's sleeping into me is 7 38 now mm -hmm. you know, i used to be able to sleep in you know, when you're younger to sleep until 9 30 10 o'clock can't do it anymore so and you yeah i wanted to actually ask you about reading what what kind of stuff do you read i like dystopian kind of the books about a, 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 a few, you know the the EMP that goes off or the the, the new 1984 oh, 1984 is Orwell I'm a, I think I've read it three times oh one of the most horrifying uh, I just I just finished a book Sinclair Lewis it 
can't happen here. And a lot of people are comparing it to Trump, but it's it's not Trump. But it's a uh, a fictional uh, fascist dictator who takes over America in the 30s as it's happening in Germany and Italy. And I read a lot of things about post-nuclear war, post-EMP going off. And uh, But then I also like sort of classic literature. I just read Moby Dick. I haven't read it, hadn't read it in years. Mm -hmm. I, I like a little Hemingway, a little Fitzgerald. So, you know, I mean, that, that that's basically. But I here, I'll tell you a quick story. I used to be one of these guys that said, uh, you will never see a Kindle in these in this hand. I like the feel of paper between my fingers. I like the sound of the pages turning. I'm a Kindle guy, 100% now. <laughs> I don't even buy or keep books. Really? The Kindle's amazing. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm reading all the time. Interesting. Yeah, are you kidding me? My wife got me a Kindle. I was like, what are you doing? And now I'm addicted to it, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still, you're still the book guy. I'm still a paper. Yeah. Man. But then it takes over your house and your closets and under your bed and you got boxes everywhere. I hope to have a big library someday <laughs> to put all of the old books in. Yeah. It seems unpractical now that I'm talking about it, but especially as a guy who's more about space than I'm telling you, but uh, I'm telling you, you, it's, it's liberating. Really? Yeah. I've got a Kindle too. I don't yeah. use it. I, that's what I used to say. I just yeah. had no way, no way this guy's going to use it. It is probably cheaper too. Uh, you, I know if you pay for a Kindle version, you oft, often will get it cheaper because I mean, it's just it's digital. Yeah, and I don't buy new stuff. So I buy old stuff, Four ninety nine a book, Six ninety nine a book, Three ninety nine. Oh, read it sweet. for free. You know, even they even have the read it for free offers. So, uh, okay. yeah. So I've, you know, I've been yeah reading a lot of that. But you're right, 1984, Brave New World. I like a lot of those. Yep. I just downloaded Both Clockwork books. Orange of all things. But I'm going to read that next. Mm -hmm. See, I guess for me, I read a lot going going to bed, and I'm all about limiting screen screen time, TV screens, cell phones, computers. If I can, you avoid think it. it's bad for what? Your well, brain, your well, eyes? Uh, maybe not so much for the brain. I mean, as far as Kindle stuff, TV might be bad for the brain. I don't know. I, I definitely don't think it activates as much, but. Maybe the eyes, maybe it exhausts you a little bit. And also blue light radiation. Yeah. So, but I mean, you could wear blue blockers, I guess, and it would be fine. But me, I get just a little, one of those clip-on reading lamps and I'm just in the dark, yeah. just kind of reading. Oh. And usually that's, hey, that's that's my sleeping pill right there. I don't, you know, I, I never have really thought much about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, when I say I watch TV at night, I watch maybe... I don't know. I, I'm a sports fan. Are you? So I watch yeah. sports. I do watch sports. Uh, all sports. Except curling. I haven't figured out curling yet. Do you know what curling is? Is it the one where you do yeah, that thing? Yeah, the sweep thing. No, yeah, it's the yeah. sweep with the, the little disc on the ice. You know, mm. God bless. Oh, Canada. Yeah. You know, it's like the national sport of Canada. Actually, hockey. Hey, I may be going to Canada next week. So. Well, I mean, say hello to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau while you're up there. All baby. right. I'll hunt him down. Yeah. <laughs> But I work on your French. Are you going to Quebec, Montreal, uh, Vancouver? Oh no, they're very Western. Oh, they're okay. very uh, American. Oh, Vancouver. Right. I'll have to go farther than at yeah, some that, point. But it's unbelievable uh, country. It's like Banff. That's like the Canadian Rockies. You're going to see some incredible scenery up there. Oh, nice. I don't travel anymore. I used to travel a lot. Yeah. Now I hate airports and hate airplanes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't like either of those things either. <laughs> who but, does? Would you trust anybody who did? Yeah, right. Yeah. I love you the TSA getting, guys. Yeah. And getting sick, being yeah. in that little um, little container that's flying across space. I, I used to love flying. But now it's like, oh. I just don't enjoy it. I don't understand why we don't have bullet trains or something like that. You Wouldn't know? that be nice? It would be you great. Know, you know, little, Elon Musk, Europe. Elon Musk in in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. there's he's building underground tunnels with these things that your car drives up onto and magnetically locks it in and just shoots you on a platform through these underground tunnels under LA. And then you get to like San Francisco or what's your I'm destination? I'm not sure. I haven't read into it much. I know no. it's in early phases. But Sounds cost prohibitive. 
It does, right? Underground. But then you'd think SpaceX would be uh, cost prohibitive, and Elon Musk is doing that. Actually, I I wish I had a Tesla. Me too. You know, did you see what I drove up in a Prius? Mm -hmm. I've had a Prius since 2005. I was the second Prius in South Mississippi. (laughs) I've I've gone through three or four of them. I love them. Really? But I would get a Tesla if uh, if I... if I could afford it, I would live Absolutely. In a, you know. I think even their base models for guys like us are like 65,000 yeah, you know, or something. You know. A lot of, you know, the all living right is, it costs a lot. It does. Yeah. Cause you know, if you think, oh boy, I'd have a house with nothing but solar panels and I'd have reclaimed water and I knew all of the right, I'd have my own organic garden. I'd love to do all those things, but you had mm-hmm. to be rich to do it. Yeah. Rich in time or money, one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how has being an active reader benefited you as a journalist or a reporter? I think it's helped me with word, with vocabulary. Mm-hmm. You know, I really think it has. With, In flow, and yeah, things like that. Yeah, yeah. I love. I, I admire writers. I can. I, I, wouldn't you love to be able? I'd love to be able to sit down and play the violin. But wouldn't it be nice to sit down and and be you know. Uh, Ernest Hemingway or somebody where you would just write this unbelievable prose and it would just come to you. And of course, they're all alcoholics. You realize that. I know. It's very <laughs> odd. Very odd. You got like artists. They're all, tw- you know, they're all. Yeah. Smoking weed and doing <laughs> mushrooms and LSD and the whole, you yeah. know, whatever else. That's Yeah, it's a common trend. You know, why can't people just lift weights and go for runs and shit? I know. You know, I don't know. Um, are there any books or articles that you would recommend to people who are seeking an area of work that is similar to, to your job uh, mm-hmm. that you've done in a career? No. How about how about like top three just most recommended books or most gifted books? You know, you, you're asking all these questions, but you're supposed to know. You, you have to think about these things. You can't. Oh just well, I thought you were off. saying. I thought you were saying no to the first one. Oh uh, no, I get to both of them. I I can't think. I books. It's like someone says, "What's your." F- well, I can actually pick my favorite movie of all time, but uh, or, uh, can't, you can't pick a favorite song of all time, can you? Yeah, I wouldn't say so. Yeah, nobody can do Films that. are a little bit more so yeah. than books, but... But, uh, yeah, I can't... Uh, uh, well, that's a hard one. How about books, like three bo- really good books that you read in the last couple months or something like that? Well, I reread 1984. So, and mm-hmm. since we talked about that, I'm going to throw that in. I think Orwell's a little better than Huxley's Brave New World, which I also have read recently. Uh, in 1984, I just want to comment for anybody who hasn't read. I was, I was, I had to read it for AP English in high school. And I was at the time I was like, mm, deep book, crazy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I picked it up as an adult a, a couple months ago and started reading it and it stressed me out. I had so much more appreciation for putting myself in in the shoes of of Winston or whatever the guy's name yeah. is. Yeah. Well, also you see some of the trends in the world mm-hmm. that point towards and where the technology and, is and how yeah. it could be implemented. And I mean, it just horrifying in in ways that I never experienced horror in a in a book. And it's not necessarily classified as a horror per se, but it's uh yeah tense book yeah i mean i really i've I, I read constantly i just can't think of you know i mean i can't even think of people's names anymore cormac you mccarthy know. you read any no of his, I, I don't no, that no country sound, for no. old men or the no, i haven't seen, even seen the film no oh country the film's one of my favorite of all yeah. time coen brothers one of the yeah, best coen two directors brothers, so yeah you got to check that one out yeah. uh and i'll the coen brothers straight because that racing arizona and fargo yeah yeah okay mm-hmm and the Big Lebowski, yeah, and Oh sure. Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, yeah. You know, great movies, great movies. And uh, just so you know, No Country. I mean, what my favorite villain of all time, Anton Sugar, played by Javier Bardem. Oh, okay, yeah, Incredible. somebody, uh, uh, just a your great age. killer at work was just talking about that movie. So I'm gonna have to uh, the I'm dialogue, to no music, out. sometimes just close dialogue, no soundtrack. Um, Shot at the same time, there will be blood with Daniel Day Lewis, who just retired from acting. He says. He says. Yeah, I found it a little weird out of nowhere. Yeah, like, he's kind what's of flaky. going on. Daniel? Unbelievable actor, but I, I'm guessing he's pretty flaky. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel Day Lewis? You kidding me? Yeah. Right. Uh, but a uh, great actor. Mm-hmm. There's a scene uh, in No Country where they had to postpone the shoot because. Uh, there will be blood. They have a huge scene where they actually lit an oil rig on fire. 
out in Texas or wherever. And the smoke, you can see the smoke in the shot in the Coen Brothers film. So they had to postpone the shooting for the day. And wow. I think there will be blood. I think... I can't remember one of those two, one film of the year. They're both phenomenal movies. Phenomenal. Um, and yeah, You mean I won an Oscar? Yes. No, I think it was um, nominated for an Oscar. Uh, Who got two... St- oh, so you're going to Google it. I sure, know. sure. Uh, film of the year 2007. Uh, no Country that? for Old Men? That's what it looks like. One or nominated it well it put that movie and then there will be blood so uh the highest grossing film no no you know isn't google amazing it is actually the internet started out with such promise and it's still for research is to me it's mind-boggling you know it's been a little it's been hijacked the internet has i think but uh Mm -hmm. But to, just to think about its original intent by the universities as a research tool, and even still today, it's amazing to me that you can Google anything. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. but you know, the Internet in general now, there's so much junk. Mm-hmm. It won four awards at the 80th Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting oh. Actor, Best Adapted Screenplay. Oh, well, there you go. Yep. I didn't think it won Best Picture, though. But it's right there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I apologize to your podcasters <laughs> for being wrong. Is we said it straight. Nope. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Google fixes everything. Yeah. So Because people at home are wondering. Or in their cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, could they be in their cars listening to us? Yeah, absolutely. Any Anywhere that you have your phone or a computer, which is how everywhere. What's been our runtime on this? We are running at one hour, 21 minutes. Is that like a record? Up? Oh no! Three hours, two and a half hours that you've done reckon, that I've done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. No, my average is like an hour and a half. But uh, if we need to wrap up, we can do so. No, I'm I'm cool for a few more minutes. My wife's probably you know put out an APB on me or something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> hey, if the newsman goes missing, what happens? Right, well, the people the fall on their of, heads. It's the end of the world as we know it. Yeah, yeah. Little REM. Um, what would you say to young people or even adults who don't? take the time to engage themselves with regular exposure to literature, whether it be novels or magazine or peer reviewed scientific studies. Why? I mean, why would, why, why would anybody avoid enlightenment? You know, even if you disagree with the data or the results or the, the author's uh, perspective, I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't judge people, but I don't know when to understand why somebody would purposefully avoid contact and engagement with those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. That's to me like, what would well, you say to somebody who doesn't vote? I, I don't know. I, mm-hmm. It's just that it's, it's the sad truth that, I mean, a lot of people are trans that don't read a whole lot instead they they get their entertainment from you know binge watching netflix or playing video games um you know your generation's in big trouble on that absolutely yeah okay just I know to let you know in case you weren't aware oh i know oh, okay i know it that's why i'm saying that's why i'm telling you i have you. a 27 year old son yeah uh but he is uh uh he's he's pretty engaged he uh, he loves reading, loves going to museums, mm-hmm. doesn't watch much TV at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, he's okay <laughs> he's in okay. terms of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that a person who reads is more better equipped to take in and assimilate news better than someone who does not? Yeah, I think so because it's all about vocabulary. Yeah, and comprehension. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I would think you know I mean if you if. You, and I, and, I, and I know people who say, I, I don't read, I can't read, I don't have time to read. I would, I would say that the points about a vocabulary and comprehension, I mean, those are important things. Mm-hmm. You know, 
Yeah. Uh, Plus, there's the danger of taking news stories at face value as well. You know, just being presented with something, whether it's news or anything else. I mean, you could be susceptible to just taking that news and going, oh, well, they said coconut oil is bad now. And it's like, well, have you done any research yourself or did you just like, oh, there's a headline on the Internet now? Yeah. So, well, you've just described Facebook. People share this and, you know, put up a link to that. And, you know, and it's all of this stuff that and and you want to know why you say coconut oil is bad or good me yeah just that i'm looking just into that. it i'm looking into it i've seen there because you know i'm sure you've seen the articles that have cropped up and everything um me i think i have a sensitivity to coconut oil so i kind of avoid it but in terms of i'm not one to um um to, to weigh off fat and saturated fat. Most of my calories come from high fats yeah. of quality. Well, you're meat. a skinny guy. I, I used am. to be skinny. Now I'm just kind of skinny. <laughs> I'm chubby for the first time in my life. Yeah. Well, Not I chubby. I think that the, that when fat, I was your age though, I was skinny like butters and stuff like that. And, and, um, beefs and coconut milk that are high in saturated fat or regular fat has taken a lot of heat and people think that those things are what make us fat when really I think it's more of the sugars and the and the carbohydrates and where I was starting with this though when you talked mm -hmm. about coconut oil is great is and people just take it at fa at face value is then the if people track it ten months later a study will come out that says coconut oil kills. And then oh wait a second, you know, I mean everything's you know changing. Yeah, it always all, going yeah. back and forth, yeah. right. And you know, I I I, I God bless you if anyone's listening and they have a gluten problem, but I don't believe that. I think that's make fake news. Could be, right? I mean, <laughs> it's a conspiracy to create an entire new line of products, isn't it? Sure, that's why diets come and go so quickly, so they can market you foods yeah. and programs to yeah, give you the. They foods tap and... out the of uh, the products and they have to create new ones. Mm -hmm. So some carbs are good for you one year and bad for you the next. You have to have low fat this, low sodium that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do think that, that corporations, the sugar industry, I mean, there was a thing just recently, a couple of months ago, that was talking about Time Magazine, how I can't remember if it was the 50s or 60s, 60s where the cover of the, the magazine was two eggs and a frowny bacon, just a strip of ba bacon in the, in the shape of a frown. And it said, uh, you know, your fat is killing you or something like that. And it was paid for by sugar industries to hire scientists to make these tests up and then publish it and run with it. And I think that's why that, that thing of fats and everything have kind of gone in that direction yeah, that's healthy you need fat I'm, it makes your butt i'm a big fan of it you know <laughs> and i'm a big fan of sugar by the way though are you oh yeah so i am pretty i'm pretty anti-sugar how much sugar is a is an average male supposed to consume a day do you know what is this a test you're asking me a yeah, serious a, question yeah, yeah i ask people how all the time okay i didn't wait, know a the a couple again? Months how much on average how much how many grams of sugar should the average male consume in a day four <laughs> you're close uh we're in double digit terry it's like th in the mid 30s i want to say oh, okay. but if you think like a banana or an apple i think a banana is or an apple's like 12 to 18 so wait you're sugar. saying sugar's good then well no <laughs> i'm saying that's we're like the limit of like how much is recommended that you shouldn't eat more than that you do need sugars and it does you know produce or create fat as a result and you need it uh, for insulin controls to regulate your mood levels. So for whatever reason, I mean, sugar is just kind of a part of what, what makes us go, you know, just like okay, salt, so you can't overdo salt either, but it's something that we need. It's yeah. crucial. You know what? I don't even, I used to, I think I used to be more addicted to salt than I am now. Now I don't even give salt a second thought, but you want to know what I don't like since you're on the subject of sugar. I don't like all the fake sugars that are out there. The, uh, name some products. What are they? Um, the, the yellow the thing, S the blue one. thing, the uh, stevia. Yeah, well, well, stevia is a plant-based uh, one. I've heard that. So that might be a good decent. one. Yeah, but I can't think of the big name. Yeah, I can't either. Yeah, the yellow, the, the little yellow package, and the little blue package, and and I prefer real sugar to that stuff now. I don't like trust cane sugar and stuff like that. Yeah, that... Well, yeah, raw sugar stuff like that. I would. I'm. I put in my coffee. I don't put the. Uh, 
I can't believe we can't think of the name of the biggest product in the world right now. The little yellow packet of stuff people use instead of sugar. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> sugar substitutes. Is right. that what you Googled? Yeah. And it's not the first out. the first three websites I went to are all shut down for some reason, <laughs> which Conspiracy. is suspicious. Yeah, somebody's suspicious. working on that. Um, what are they called? Sugar alternatives or uh, I you, thought substitutes. Substitutes. Yeah, sugar substitutes. Yeah, so let's it's take embarrassing a look at that. that we can't. Uh, Asper aspartame. No, it's not even a bit. The big one of the big Steve ones. Steva, the lead assay. They're giving me all these weird margaricides and that sucks. Probably pretty good. Yeah, I'm talking about the ones that people are consuming. Yeah, the brand yeah. name stuff. That's what well, that's what we want. Uh, I will say though, as as I'm looking, Equal. Yeah, Equal. Truvia. Yeah, Equal's yeah. a big one, I think. Yeah. And then they have raw, you know, the raw sugars, the coconut sugars. How do they and, keep coming up with names for all the new medicines they keep coming out with right now? I don't know. When are they going to run out of names? I don't How know. Do, what do they just throw a bunch of letters into a hat and throw it up in the air and then it comes down? And yeah, why don't they? Uh, why don't they just make something yeah. that's a little bit more? I hate the new medicines. I'm so glad I don't have high cholesterol or high blood pressure. Knock on wood. Because I would never want to be taking the medicines they're making today. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, yeah. which Big is why I watch my sugar intake. <laughs> Big pharma, get them out of here. Yeah. Or at least regulate the heck out of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that you can use, dark. I use black strap unsulfured molasses. You see, you're going, you know, that's, you have to really be dedicated. It, you do. do. You do. Yeah. You got to find out. I but told it, you earlier I smoked. Do you think I'm, <laughs> I'm the kind of guy, do you think a guy who smokes cigarettes? <laughs> you got to find your battles, is, man. Is going to, uh, Think too much hey, about what he puts in his body. It's a really dark yeah. syrup that you can put in your coffee, and it gives it that bold flavor. And it's the lowest sugar content of any of the the honeys, the agavas, you know, all that stuff. The I will tell you one thing: I don't drink a drop of alcohol. Oh, okay, okay. You know, I hate saying that when I go to parties and stuff like that, mm -hmm. because then as you're walking away, you know what they're saying? What? Reformed alcoholic. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Which is not true. I want to make that perfectly clear. I Did you drinking. never drink? No, or? I used to drink a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'd go and have a gin and tonic at dinner. I never liked wine. I'd have an ice cold beer if I was grilling out around the pool. Mm -hmm. Or if when I was in college and I went to parties, of course, you know, someone would have to, you know, drive me home. But in the last 25 years, I, just, I hate being around drunk people. You ever go to a place? <laughs> <laughs> Dave Elliott. Well, I've been watching it for, if you, oh, Jesus. Yeah. So I, be, I don't, I don't even leave the house now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as, as a, as a guy who is just all about health and fitness stuff, and I'm a certified. That's you, trainer. not me. I want to make that clear. Right, right. But, okay. but uh, for me, it's just, uh, I don't particularly feel that great after you know you get to the buzz zone, and it's like, hey, well, this is cool. But, you know, the high school drunk and that kind of thing that, you know, used to have no like major side effects, you know, I'm much more aware of it now and I just don't care for it. And I also don't like anything that gives me a false sense of confidence or uh, makes me more talkative or whatever like that. Like I should be able to manage my own fun and, and personality just as at a base level, you yeah. know, and I feel like a lot of people, it becomes a handicap for them. It becomes a social thing for them. Well, of course, you're describing America. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, you just uh, gave us, uh, you know, the, uh, the prototypical uh, kind of uh, Friday night in America right there, didn't you? Or yeah. Yeah, but I can't stand it. You know, there's the sloppy drunk. No one wants to no, run into the sloppy drunk. Mm -hmm. There's the angry drunk, the mad drunk. You don't want to run into the mad drunk. No, mm -hmm. no that's bad news, mm -hmm. especially if you're a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the kind of lovable, mellow out drunk. They're not too bad. Yeah. yeah. Sloppy and angry, though. I'll avoid them like the play. Yeah. And when you start getting those folks together all in one nightclub, <laughs> you never know who's going to show up where or what's going to happen. So, yeah, safer to stay home and... uh I say tax the hell out of alcohol. If they're going to tax the hell out of cigarettes, they can tax the hell out of alcohol. Mm -hmm. But whatever. Yeah. What do you think about marijuana legalization? I'll legalize it. 
Big lies. I think, but here, you know what? I was reading an interesting article the other day. It's already beginning to happen in Colorado. All the little mom and pop hippie stores that big, were there at the very, very beginning are already starting to be gobbled up by regional uh, corporations and companies. Mm -hmm. And I was reading an article the other day where if America ever legalized it nationally, do you, you know who'd be growing your marijuana? Monsanto. I hate to break it to you. Mm -hmm. It starts out as this wonderfully organic kind of, uh, and I think medical marijuana is a no-brainer. I think you're in the dark ages if you're a state that doesn't sign, like Mississippi sign mm -hmm. off on the, the value of medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. But uh, legalized recreational marijuana, the jury I think is still out. Colorado, Washington, Nevada just uh, passed it. So we'll have mm -hmm. to see what happens in a state like Nevada with it. Right. It's uh, going to generate taxes. There's no doubt about it. But my fear is, and I, I, as I said, I've been reading articles about it, the little mom and pop hippie places that were there at the very beginning are already starting to get gobbled up mm -hmm. by bigger and bigger fish. Mm -hmm. And eventually it'll be Monsanto mm -hmm. <laughs> growing the pot. Yeah. And that's not what we want. Yeah. Which is, it's really weird in this case because pharmaceutical and alcohol companies um, have, they've been one of the biggest lobbyers against the legalization movements because they want to figure out how to establish themselves in the industry before they, you know, before something that we call weed because it just grows everywhere if you wanted it to. How do you capitalize on that and make it profitable and sell it to everybody? And I think that's got to be incredibly hard to, to do, you know. I'm sure it'll go commercial and pharmaceuticals and Monsanto and everybody will yeah, jump into it. But course. at the same time, I mean, if you can throw some seeds in your backyard and it's legal to do so, I don't understand why just everybody wouldn't do that, you know, super cheap. And, uh, you know, so I don't understand how they're going to possibly. You know, I, mean, I, I think you can still do that now, even though it's illegal. They're not going to bust you if they have a couple of pot plants in the backyard. <laughs> now, if, if you're. Okay. <laughs> that's not, I'm not advising the kids to do that. But if, you know, I mean, you know, if, you, if, you know you're driving down I-10 and you have, you know, 64 kilos in the fake false bottom of your Camaro, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah, of course you're going to get busted, but yeah. you know, I think you can, come on, it's 2017, people can't grow a couple of plants in the backyard, mm -hmm. a little grow room in the house. Right. I think you can get away with that. Yeah. 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 I think it's, it's definitely going to change. We are behind on that. I did the, like the 33rd podcast I did, I did at the Jackson State Capitol with uh, Senator Josh Harkins, sure. who did the bill for the Harper Grace bill. So I did with the girl's mom, the little girl who was sick to get CBD cannabidiol oils. And uh, I was there and it eventually got through, but it's still just very, that was two or three years ago. And it's just still, you don't hear a whole lot of it. Meanwhile, the feds have old Mrs. Uh, natural Labs or whatever they yeah, call it. Have you ever it, seen it? No, I emailed the doctor. I was like, hey, let me... <laughs> I want to talk to you. I've seen it. Really? Yeah. Yeah? It's you, unbelievable. Really? Yeah. Can you... Can you <laughs> I'd ask you to describe it, but no, yeah, it's a I, lot of plants, uh, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, when I saw it, it was like 20 years ago or something, so I don't remember. It's... it's kind of a, a, a last time I was actually at Ole Miss was for 2008 for the Obama McCain debate that I covered which was uh, kind of cool mm. but um, I haven't been up at Ole Miss in a long time mm. went to a f football game and froze my ass off recently why don't we get why don't we team up <laughs> you bring your Facebook live stuff we'll go through there I do a in. podcast they can let us in let us see the alien weed you know yeah. that they're growing there was uh, I knew the only reason I did is I knew Chancellor Kayat very well I don't know if you remember Robert Kayat the Chancellor up there but uh, he pulled some strings for me he's no longer there I think Ole Miss is actually in a weird place right now but, really yeah I think hmm. they're all confused about what they want to be part of their past they want to shed and be embarrassed about and, oh uh, yeah just don't know where they don't know where they are so i think uh -huh. but uh yeah i knew uh, uh chancellor kayad very well he's a, from the gulf coast so uh I, I when i was up there for the debate in 2008 i was able to get into a lot of back door kind of things because i knew the chancellor well so hmm. 
There's got to be somebody we can talk to. I'm going to have to do some research. <laughs> you know, they try to keep it. They've they've really clamped down on that, but they because they used to have a little more accessibility to it. So. Mm. All righty, Stefan. Well, my wife hey, is going to be it's really been great. mad. No, we could have talked about a hundred different things. Hey, come back anytime. I'm telling no. you, the studio's always open okay. to you. I mean, we start out talking about, uh, you know, radio and television and ended up talking about marijuana, marijuana and, and, uh, <laughs> and gluten. Hey, and books and all that stuff. Yeah. Good stuff, man. I Except love it. my mind. I can't remember when you say, what are your three favorite books? I'll go on the way driving home. Mm -hmm. so it'll come to me. Yeah. Well, hey, shoot them off to me. I'd oh, love okay. to. Uh, and I'll, you know, one day we'll go through the library and I might be able to recommend some stuff. You're going to uh, regret that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, why don't you start <laughs> filling boxes? Well, man, I'm going to have to do something with them because I've got some pretty serious travel plans in the near future, so they're going to have to go somewhere. So I do see the, the you know, I guess it's old school. Everybody likes to have their old school traits or whatever, and I guess books are still mine. Well, you know? I was until just five years ago, so yeah. you've got a long way to go. Yeah. I was the same way. Yep. But I just changed about five years ago. Kenny Kindle now. Yep. Well, That's hey, when they I, called me. eventually at some point, this thing will be so small, it'll be the size of, you know, a little, little chip that you just, you know, put it in your head. You've got Google, anything you think of, you got the answer right there. I, you know? I don't find a lot of comfort in that. Don't dig it. No. No, we won't no. even. I go places don't even bring We won't have phone. to talk to each other. We'll just telepathy. <laughs> no. Internet in each other's heads. Telepathic, you, know? you can figure out. I, I go That's places. That's how we become the aliens. People don't believe. <laughs> That's the beginning of the uh, alien <laughs> Uh, species. I I uh, I go places and people don't believe us. I don't bring my phone. Ta da! I don't know why. That's like I made it like a proclamation, and you're just staring at me, nodding your head. No, I, I do it sometimes too. Oh, okay. you, know, you ever just leave your phone and, <laughs> and go and figure it out? You know, yeah, I do. rely I on people and resources and know how and street smarts. You know, yeah, it's I fun. Don't, don't even bring the phone. I don't watch anything on my phone. Shouldn't tell a podcast guy like that, I guess. But no, you said you don't watch television, so now we're no. even. Yep. Okay. Yep. All righty, Stefan. All right, man. Thanks. Where can people go to uh, see? I always ask guests uh, if there was somewhere they want to see your work or, um, or, or or some sort of outlet online to keep up with you, with your activities. Do you have anything you want to throw out there? Well, or? I have WTheAllTheWax.com. I have uh, my Facebook page, just Dave Elliott. And then I have David Elliott at WTheAllTheWax TV. And then I'm obviously, what is it, at Dave Elliott, WLOX on my Twitter that's it. All right. I don't have anything else. Cool. I don't have, you know, uh, any place that people can go and I perform uh, whenever the rodeo comes to town. Perform. So they can always. No, I've never. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that's <laughs> that feels like a, a bump down with yeah. everything else you do. Yeah, you know, they like those guys get hobby. impaled. Yeah, it's just a hobby. But uh, no, actually, have you been to rodeo? I don't think I have. I don't know if I would support it either. I was watching some no, horrible. Watch some on TV where this oh, big fat guy jumped off a horse onto a baby calf and like nearly broke its neck. Ro ro it's they're terrible. What is the point of this? It's like a fishing rodeo. Who's you cheering ever go this to on? The fishing rodeo here. Fishing rodeo. Take so. your kids down to see the dead fish. No, oh I'm not going to take the kids down. But you know, you you want to know why the Broncos buck? Isn't it because they strap and put pressure points on them? <laughs> you think? Oh, they're wild Mustangs. No, they're not. They're, they're in pain. pain. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, man, this was a right, lot of fun. Stephen. Thank you okay, so much. This is a it, good time. Good okay, time. we'll do it again. Let's do it. Okay, Let's I'll do promote it. it next time. All right. And maybe Sounds promote good. it this time. Why not? Okay, brother. Thanks. All right. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Ah. <sighs>